Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, my name is Matthias Liedl. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Religious Studies Program. Uh, I would also like to express my thanks to the Center of Eastern Mediterranean Studies, which is uh, co-organizing for supporting um, this event today. Um, our speaker tonight is Levan Gigineshvili, who is an associate professor at Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, he received a PhD from uh, this institution, from Central European University, uh, Medieval Studies in 2000, with a doctorate dissertation entitled The Platonic Theology of Janne Petrizzi, which also was published as a book by Gorgias Press in the United States in 2007. Um, he has uh, taught a variety of courses in Byzantine literature, Christianity and Paganism, Late Antiquity, uh, History of Medieval Philosophy, and, and other things at uh, Jakob. Yabak Kishvili, uh, Tbilisi State University and Iga State, and is currently working on an English translation and critical edition of Ioanne Petrizzi's annotated translation of uh, Proclus Elements of Theology. Uh, Petrizzi will also be one of the major figures in um, this presentation tonight, uh, together with uh, the other uh, most eminent uh, figure of, of medieval Georgian philosophy, the poet um, Shota Rustavi. Rustavi. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, for First of all, let me express my gratitude for inviting me to the lecture of this very interesting uh, field. For me, it's very interesting. I think not only for me, but uh, also for everybody, it's very interesting. Uh, who is interested in a uh, uh, relationship between uh, religion and philosophy. It's a perennial issue, of course, and uh, it has not uh, kind of ready-made solutions. I think uh, every person has to establish his or her own existential, uh, uh, how to say, uh, understanding of those issues. It, it should be lived. It's not a, some kind of a knowledge which uh, one can possess as a stone in a pocket and uh, take it uh, every time. It's a dynamic knowledge which uh, is kind of a, uh, which appears with, uh, while you think. Uh, about those uh, two things, religion and philosophy, and with this friction, some knowledge, some kind of uh, perceptions can appear. So today we shall treat also this, uh, I, I shall try to uh, tackle this issue uh, with uh, reference to philosophy as it came to Georgia. So, first of all, what is, um, just uh, to make a very uh, crude uh, kind of uh, introduction of what is, what, what I understand to be religion and then what is a philosophy. So philosophy, advent of philosophy in the world can be dated. It's like 6th century uh, BC. It's happened in Greece. Nobody knows why it happened, but it happened. So and what, is, uh, and what, what is the attitude in philosophy? What, how it differs from the previous attitude, which was like mythopoetic or religious attitude? In philosophy, there is not a ready-made truth. There is a certain intuition, and you are wondering about something which you don't understand yet, and you try to establish a clarity in it through your own mental efforts, through like actualizing your inner ability of thinking, of uh, dialectical thinking, which was called in Greek tradition logos. And this logos was not considered to be something uh, subjective or personal, but it was logos, a discourse in which everybody could participate. It was like a supra-subjective discourse in a way. Like Heraclitus says that you should listen not to me, but to Logos. Let's say he separates himself from the Logos. The Logos is something that enlightens subjects and not, it does not sprout from subject as a, like totally belonging to him. But Logos is something objective which can be a bridge between different subjects. If they conscientiously think within these terms of this Logos. And Heraclitus ends this phrase like, if everybody will listen to Logos, everybody would come to understanding that the world is one, the reality is one. So there is this uh, uh, philosophical wondering about reality. As a, uh, in Aristotle's terms, if, you, yeah, if one paraphrases Aristotle, he says philosophy starts with wondering, wondering about reality. Taumazen, Taumazen is to be, uh, it's a kind of Taumite miracle. So reality uh, comes before you comes in front of you as a miracle, which you have to explain by your theoretical efforts, theoretical thoughts. And theory itself is something super subjective, because the 
theory, it can be mean like it's composite. It can mean to view gods or view divinely, or uh, it's kind of divine vision of objective reality. When Greek said gods, it's not it's not necessarily a, a kind of personal god, but it's kind of objectivity in the universe. And philosophy starts with the faith that there exists this objectivity in the universe. There exists a meaning in the universe, and this meaning is ultimately good. That's the intuition of uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, over against, uh, so, uh, over against sophists, yeah, sophistic uh, skepticism. So this philosophy, what is how it differs, in my opinion, from religion. In religion, this you get the understanding of the true reality, through which you have to power your path in philosophy by your mental efforts. In religion, these efforts are not in a way necessary because the basic knowledge is, I mean, in revealed religions, yes, is revealed to a person, not necessarily because of his or her dialectical efforts, but simply because of simple heart or whatever, but it is revealed. So it's the truth of revelation. If, if, I, if this metaphor is allowed, uh, it's like philosopher is like climbing a thorny tree and plucking this apple from a tree while being bloody with his thorns. Uh, but uh, a prophet stands beneath the tree and the apple falls from the tree by God himself. So, and this apple is true apple. And philosopher may not be sure whether the apple is true or not, because it's open to criticism. But prophet is not open to criticism. He's open to interpretation, but not to criticism. And that's why history of philosophy is full of quarrels. Philo history of philosophy is a history of quarrel, because there is always an opening for doubt. That's why even in one, within one school you have a quarrel of philosophers. In Neoplatonists, for instance, what can be more homogeneous school, yes? But even in Neoplatonists you have uh, different Neoplatonists of different authors. But in, uh, in, the, in the tradition of prophetic truth, prophet cannot oppose prophet. In principle, he cannot. So, uh, pro prophecy, revelation, cannot oppose the revelation. It can deepen the previous revelation, but not oppose it. But in philosophy, you can oppose the other philosopher and deny his or his ideas. I don't say her ideas because philosophy was mostly practiced by males at the time which I'm speaking about, with uh, singular ex uh, exceptions like tragic uh, Hypatia, for instance, or uh, Diotima. But Diotima was an imaginary figure whom uh, Socrates introduced as his kind of uh, his uh, himself somehow in the face of Diotima. So uh, in, when, I when I'm speaking about uh, advent of philosophy in Georgia, so before philosophy came to Georgia, and, and it uh, can be dated like 11th century, and it continued until 13th century, before Mongol invasion and all the culture um, uh, like went down, and the Dark Ages followed, yes, after that, before 18th century, when the new revival started. But uh, so philosophy came to Georgia in 11th century, but what was before? Before was a a uh, so few centuries of Christian writings. It, was, it started in the 5th century. Mostly these were biblical books, New Testament books, New Testament, Old Testament. Not entirely, of course, but uh, uh, gradually they started to translate the entire Bible and liturgical texts, like uh, because the uh, life of church consists of liturgy, of prayer, so all these things should have been translated in Georgia. And also the interpretations of Bible, so theological literature was uh, uh, translated in a, like large amounts, like everything, like every great uh, Greek uh, Byzantine theologian was translated in Georgia. Uh, Cappadocians, uh, Maximus, um, even uh, some theologians from uh, Syria, let's say Ephraim, and uh, so many, many things were translated in Georgia, and uh, this uh, culture of translation also gave some kind of a philosophical, um, how to say, attitudes, uh, because when you are interpreting Bible, Bible is revealed truth, but this revealed truth always needs an interpretation. And while interpreting, you are putting your uh, mental efforts. In a way, it's kind of a philosophy. It could be called a true philosophy because the true um, idea of the authentic being is open, revealed. And now you only have to explain this revelation. And also, if you watch to the Bible and the New Testament or Old Testament, it's full of riddles. Like a Russian philologist, Sergei Averintsev, uh, has a uh, nice, uh, I'll say, uh, insight that strangely, 
Gospels are devoid of uh, um, value judgments. They're very scanty value judgments there, but mostly they're full of riddles. So they invite you to think over those riddles. Actually, it's an uh, interesting thing, a paradoxical thing, that Jesus explains to his disciples everything, but he speaks to people in parables. But it should be vice versa, yes? He should explain to ordinary people and uh, leave parables as uh, unexplained, as riddles to his disciples. But he does vice versa, and why? I don't know, but my explanation would be that if you veil the truth with metaphors, you are not oppressing people by this, by your truth. If, you, if they are not ready to accept this truth, you are giving a veil of metaphor. And it on, depends on their own efforts whether to uncover those, met those metaphors or not. And when they do put the efforts of uncovering those metaphors, they already are prepared to watch the brilliance of the truth. Whereas the disciples are already ready to accept the very brilliance of the truth, because they are prepared. Perhaps the same is with reading Gospels. When you're interpreting it, and Gospels always invite you to interpret it. There are no ready-made answers there. So by your efforts, you're preparing to understand more and more within it. So you uncover greater and greater meaning. So this tradition of uh, interpretation of Gospels was existing in Georgia even before advent of philosophy per se. But philosophical texts were not translated before, before the 11th century. Actually, we have a uh, 10th century hymn uh, to Georgian language. It's uh, Ioannes Zosime, and, and some ecclesiastic, he was a man probably, and he writes a hymn, uh, panegyrics of Georgian language. And he simply wants to say that Georgian language is, no, uh, if, is in no way inferior to Greek. Because, and he compares Georgian language to si and Greek language to sisters of Lazarus. You remember Lazarus from New Testament, when the um, sisters of Lazarus are Mary and Martha, and when Jesus comes to the house of Mary and Martha, Mary sits at the legs of Jesus, and Martha is in, on the, in the kitchen and uh, worried about m many things. And then Martha comes and says, that, reprimands her sister and saying to, saying to Jesus, that, say to my sister that she left me alone. So Martha is busy with many things, but still alone. But uh, Mary is alone with Jesus, but not alone. Because if you are with truth, you are not alone. But if you are with many things, but not with truth, you are alone. Something like this is happening there. But Martha is compared to Greek language, and Mary is compared to Georgian. Because, uh, because Georgian language is uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and translates only Gospels and uh, interpretations of Gospels. But uh, Mary is busy with many things, with philosophy, with, uh, I don't know, with uh, antique, uh, antique literature, Homer, and all the different things. So, in, in a way, he, he kind of equates Georgian with Greek, but also, in a way, putting Georgian about Greek, because it's more pious language. But, of course, uh, it couldn't last long, so Georgian also, also became Marta as a, in the course of its development. And uh, so uh, we have first a text of philosophy translated in the 11th century. That's not to say that the Georgians had no uh, vision and understanding of philosophy before. We have lives of saints in which we read that, for instance, Gregory of Hansta in uh, 9th, beginning of 10th century, was reading extensively also philosophic texts. But he could not have done it in Georgian because it was not translated. But we learned that he knew Greek, he knew Arabic, so he could have done it in these two languages, or Syria, maybe, or Armenian. So, and, uh, uh, but uh, before the 11th century, we had no philosophic text. From the 11th century, it extensively, it starts uh, um, this uh, new tradition of translating philosophic works. And uh, first of all, it is a uh, work of John of Damascus of 8th century, uh, century theologian from Damascus. I think he was not a bishop, no? No, he was not a bishop. He was a, he was a theologian because he lived in Damascus under the king of uh, Damascus and Khalif of the Damascus. And uh, so he wrote Aged Nocells, a uh, source of knowledge. So it was a source of all Christian knowledge. It contained parts against heresies, contained parts of uh, the, you know, like a precise exposition of uh, faith of Orthodox Christians. And it also contained parts on dialectics of Aristotle. Before 11th century, this book was translated in its entirety save the part of philosophy. Philosophy was not translated. The dialectic of Aristotle was not translated. But since 11th century, we have already numerous translations. We have extant two translations of 
uh, John of Damascus dialectics, done by Ephraim Tsiran, and uh, Tsiran is minor. Ephraim is a minor, and Arsene is alto So So the, the, this uh, multiplicity of translations shows that different translators were not, how to say, content with previous translations. They wanted to get it right. So to put the correct terminology, and that's why you see the different uh, translations, like the rival translations. Yeah? And also we have in the 11th century translation of by the same Epranzire of, uh, Dion of entire corpus Dionysiacum. So it's again a link of philosophy and theology, a unique link of philosophy and theology, and the Platonic uh, theology and Christian religion. Especially it's important Dionysian religion of universal eros. Universal eros that is like um, of all cosmos, entire cosmos, participating in eros towards the one. The term eros became very important for Dionysius. It was not before, before him. So it's a fi fictional name, of course. He was a 5th century writer, fifth beginning 6th century writer. So through Dionysius, the philosophy came, this uh, Platonic philosophy came to Georgia. But these first uh, sproutings of philosophy in Georgia are not yet philosophy in the terms of uh, Aristotle, let's say. When Aristotle said that I start philosophizing by my desire to knowledge. Like metaphysics starts with this grand phrase, yes? All humans by nature desire to know. So it's most fundamental human feature of marveling and uh, like initiating in yourself this uh, search, search of reality. Not so in in the first sprouting of philosophy in Georgia. Because philosophy was regarded mostly as auxiliary for theology. So why do we need to search reality when reality is given already in theology? So we simply need it for some other reasons. And what are those reasons? Those reasons can be polemical or proselytic, or both can go together because when you are polemicizing uh, with pagans or with uh, non-Christians, uh, you are exposing your uh, religion in their terms and defeat them through their own terminology, through their own categories. And by defeating them, you can also convert them. So it has auxiliary importance for like exposing, for like vindicating your faith in front of the other, in front of other cultures. Because dialectical tools of Aristotle are free from being inserted within a certain tradition. It's a free, it's a open to all traditions. Because there's no Christian mathematics and Buddhist mathematics. Because in mathematics there is such a um, universal field in which everybody can participate. So the Alexis was also considered such a universal bridging uh, discourse between different cultures. And that's why Ephraim says very, in a very militant way that through the Alexis we can pierce the hearts of our enemies with their own arrows. So and all Arsene says that we are protecting the beautiful garden of Christian truth, which does not actually need to defend, but we defend it still from uh, people, those who are outside the church, by thorny fence of dialectics. But this beautiful garden is as such beautiful, it does not need any quibbling or any dialectics. So this is the first uh, introduction of philosophy in Georgia, and uh, I, I told you it's kind of ankyla theology, as in Latin, like it's a maid servant of theology. But then something changes. And the change occurs in the beginning of 12th century with Gelati school. Gelati is a monastic school which uh, was opened by or um, set up by King David the Builder in uh, 1106. So in 1106, uh, Gelati monastic monastery was built, and it, on the pressing of this uh, monastery, there was a school. And uh, the, this uh, hagiographer of life of uh, King David writes that this school is a second Athens and New Jerusalem. Look, this Athens and Jerusalem has a long history in, in Christian uh, uh, patristics. Yeah? Athens and Jerusalem, it uh, comes from Tertullian. And Tertullian divides those two terms, saying that what connection is there between Saturn and Christ? What connection is there between Athens and Jerusalem, philosophy and Christian religion. But when the Georgian Chronicle writes that Gelati is Athens and Jerusalem together, he says that this is a school where the synthesis should happen. And many Georgians in this school were studying philosophy, he said. So philosophy was not considered as some kind of ogre and some kind of a dangerous thing, but it was a very good thing. You can 
it can be um, good for uh, your own religiosity when you may understand better your own religion through philosophies. So Athens and Jerusalem. And in Galati you see already um, the flourishing of translation of philosophic texts. But an attitude is different already towards philosophy. If uh, you see uh, the translation of by Galatians of uh, Ammonius, the son of Hermias, it's a 5th century Neoplatonist philosopher. So uh, Ammonius Hermias' words are uh, translated, and this word says that philosophy is the greatest gift of God to humans. Through philosophy, you can assimilate yourself to God as much as it is possible for humans. So it's totally novel attitude to philosophy. And within this culture comes a figure about whom uh, I, I should uh, speak somewhat more. It's Ioanne Patrizzi. So Ioanne Patrizzi, he came from milieu of Constantinopolitan philosophic school, which was established by Michael Pselos in 10, um, no, no, Constantinus Monomachus, by the you know, emperor in 1045. So uh, there were two schools. One was a uh, law school and another philosophic school. The philosophic school was led by polymath Mikhail Pselos. So Pselos taught international audience of his students philosophy. And uh, the atmosphere in Pselos school was very free. Of course, the school was not like European universities, like a free um, consortium of uh, students and lecture. It was under the uh, guidance of an imperial court. But still, the free thought was happening there. And Pselos allowed a large extent of freedom to his students. And uh, his disciple, uh, like, uh, his disciple who later became the um, uh, second rector of the school, was John Italus, a um, philosopher from Lombard. He was from Italy, that's why he was called Italus. And already with Italus, the school um, uh, adopted some dangerous stances for the church, because Italus started to philosophize and to put under question the church dogmas. So dogmas in church are, were believed and are still believed uh, by, by faithful to be an um, outcome, like if, if the church council and there is some dogma adopted there, universal church, church council, the outcome of the council is received as a truth, received as a kind of a, um, inspired uh, agreement by Holy Spirit, as it is a, from the first uh, the Council of Apostles, uh, Paul says that Holy Spirit and we desire to convene a, a council to decide certain questions. So that the very um, summoning of council and deciding of question for this, this religious uh, vision is um, guided by Holy Spirit. Therefore, the dogmas are like uh, unquestionable. But Italus started to question the very dogmas through philosophy. So he came to a point where his conscience, personal understanding of truth, through dialectics, is, comes at odds with church tradition. And then Italus solves this dilemma by following his own conscience. It happened before Luther, far before Luther. But it happens in Byzantium. So Italus was not a <coughs> heretic uh, who established new church, new tradition in church. But he was a philosopher who, when he collided with certain things with which he could not agree, he adhe adhered to his own self, to his own conscience. And that's why that was the basis of his heresy. And he was, his ideas were condemned, and later when he did not repent, he also was condemned. And the school of Pselos was closed in 1083. And the, so that, it was a reaction against this humanistic attitude of the school, the rationalistic and humanistic attitude of the school. Actually, it was not only with uh, Pselos and Italus, but also the immediate circle of Pselos had such broad visions. That is, John Mauropus, Pselos' friend, friend and the head of the law school, he has a verse, a, a little verse, uh, a prayer verse, I would say. He asked uh, Jesus that, uh, uh, of course, they live before you and they have no bless blessing of a baptism, but I beseech you, please rescue from the hell two persons, Plutarch and Plato, though they were very good people. So, and so this broad attitude that also no pagans of a high virtue can be saved, that there is also in Pselos' immediate circle. But this was considered dangerous by, uh, and there was communion reaction against such uh, things, and 
So the school was closed and disciples were dispersed all around the world, all around the empire. The, uh, the Georgian scholarly uh, uh, conjuncture is that Patrizzi was part of this school, and I also think that he must have been part of this school, because his education is, how to say, very uh, academic. He's not a self-learner. He seems to have passed all those disciplines, like all those trivium, quadrivium system, yes? So this, uh, three logical disciplines and four mathematical disciplines that he speaks about it. His uh, education seems to be very academic. And so the conjecture is that Patrizzi was part of this school and then he came to Georgia when Galati monastic school was opened. And so he started to philosophize in Georgia. And uh, he understands that he brings something totally new to Georgian audience. But maybe I have spoken uh, for too long and if you have immediate questions, I'll stop myself for a while. Just for two, two minutes, if you have like a, already a questions. I usually do so during my lecture. So, yes. so. Uh, I didn't, didn't uh, exactly understand the reasons of uh, these translations, philosophical translations in the uh, Which are the main reasons which you could As I told you, the, the very translators of those texts were putting those reasons, polemical reasons. That when pagan philosophers, let's say, or those outside church attack us, they use certain terminologies which we do not understand. They use terminology like essence, individual, accidents, and we don't know what it is. So let us learn it, and let us oppose them within their own terms. Let, like uh, if you are a warrior, yes, or a uh, like chivalrous contest, and uh, this church, you have to wear certain armor, you have to wear certain uniform. Unless you wear it, you cannot go to the contest. So these philosophic terms are like your uniform to, uh, to engage in battle with uh, pagan philosophers. So and it's auxiliary. And of course, uh, they will not say that it's necessary for all Christians to learn those tools. But it uh, has auxiliary importance for attacking the attackers. They would say that they are like uh, great uh, ascetics who fight their passions in the monastic caves, who, who do not know anything about dialectical tools, but they're, not, they're even better Christians than best dialecticians. It's possible. But in engaging ourselves in quarrel with philosophers, we have to learn their language. So that's why, yes? Did you have philosophers in Georgia in that period? Why would you learn it? I mean, Sorry? Did you have philosophers? Ah, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Of, cor of course, um, um, uh, it's a, uh, we did not have at that time philosophers, yes. Maybe it's a return. Uh, so whom they are attacking, I, 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 I don't know. At the time, there was not a free philosophy who attacked the church doctrine. Yeah? Uh, Bob, uh, you're talking about translation. But, what about, yeah. but, but, but perhaps they are simply repeating uh, some topos which was in Byzantine literature and putting those reasons which were, they have read in Byzantine literature. That's what they thought. Yeah, perhaps, they yes. Talking about yes. Philosophers um, you're talking about translations. What about the original texts? I mean, did they have access to um, um, philosophical texts? I, 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 wouldn't think, I don't think so. No, they didn't have access to they? the very Plato and Aristotle. They were using the Damascene's elaboration of Porphyry's elaboration of Aristotle. Yeah. That, that, uh, it's, it's a mediation. Mm -hmm. the, the, their philosophy was mediated philosophy, but not with, Pat not with Patrizzi. Patrizzi's philosophical readings are immediate. He reads Plato, he reads Proclus, he even reads fragments of Presocratics, and he's a free philosopher. In a sense, he's uh, navigating with these texts freely. And he understands his novel and pioneering role in Georgia. He thinks that there was no philosophy before him in proper sense of the world, in, in the sense of this Aristotelian wandering. He somehow took philosophy out of this uh, how it's called, jar, uh, like a gym is uh, confined in a jar, this uh, spirit, and he put the spirit outside of it. So it's already free attitude to philosophy. And he says, like, I, I will Aristotelize. So I will use philosophy as Aristotle uses it. So he, uh, he uh, invents a verb in Georgia to Aristotelize, okay, to engage in this philosophical inquiry about reality. And he sees that through dialectics you can uh, arrive to a novel vision, a novel knowledge, which was not available for you before this dialectical efforts was put. Through dialectics you are engaging and you are attaching yourself to a field which is a necessary field. 
But this necessity is not a necessity of kind of a fatalism. This is a good necessity. Like a, in Plato's uh, myth of the cave, there is a the philosopher, the man who starts to think in cave, to watch to the fire, and then he's dragged out of the cave. And this dragging out of the cave is a, indicates to necessity. But if you engage in philosophic thinking, you are in a field of necessity. You necessarily think in that way, and in, in, not in, this, in, another, in another way. The other way which uh, kind of pleases you. No, you engage into some objective way of thinking. And this objectivity drags you to novel vision of reality. And for Patrizzi, this objectivity of dialectical tools is uh, your passage from, is a tool for your passage from visible to invisible. Dialectics for him is, uh, in a way, voyage, uh, traveling from visible to invisible. But this can be achieved only if you have correct terminology. He says, Greek language is abyss-like. It's, it's like abyss. It's deep as an abyss. And uh, in Greek language, one term can convey different meanings. So if philosopher does not penetrate into all meanings of the word and, and construct the same term for different Greek concepts, then it will hinder your way of philosophizing. And it will hinder your passage from visible to invisible. And this passage is uh, most important not only for philosophic life, life, but for life of every man, for Patrizzi. Because we, every, every one of us, has these uh, um, eyes of intellect. But some of us have these eyes of intellect, uh, it's a metaphor, of course, some of them have closed these eyes of intellect, by, so they cannot penetrate the, the reasons and causes of reality, but philosophers open those eyes, and they penetrate the causes of reality, and these causes are invisible. They are ideal causes of reality. But you should have correct terminology. That's why Patrizzi criticizes all, all these people who uh, translate the philosophical term before him, because he says that they are putting different Greek concepts to the same Georgian term. So they, uh, they inhibit everybody to really philosophize. But in himself he sees a certain guru, certain uh, uh, our kind of a, a bodhisattva of philosophy who brought correct terminology and who uh, opened the path of philosophizing to Georgia. And this path is vision of the ideal Platonic forms. So through dialectics, through philosophy, you are viewing, beholding the Platonic forms. And that's your initiation. That's your development. That's your ultimate goal to see the divine perfections in divine intellect. So you attach your intellect to divine intellect. And your intellect gets saturated with divine ideas. It's like a, a drop of a water, which is formless. If it goes up to the sky, chilly sky, then it gets a beautiful form of a flake. So is a philosopher. He ascends with his spirit to this vision of the beautiful forms. And his soul and intellect also imprints those forms in itself. So he becomes a beautiful. So, soul is beautified by beholding the beauty. So that's for Patrizzi, uh, immaterial beauty beautifies your own soul. And that's true house of human soul, to be there in the field of immaterial ideas. But the problem is that he thinks that this is achievable through philosophy, through dialectics. And this was achieved by pagan philosophers, by Plato, by Proclus, whose life he describes as life of a saint. So, of course, this is a problem for a church, yes? Uh, because uh, if you say that uh, those visions uh, can be achieved through dialectics, where is the role of a church? And uh, you can understand why Patrizzi was persecuted in his time by church, severely persecuted. He says, I was persecuted both in Byzantium and in Georgia. And those Georgians who persecuted me, they did not understand anything in dialectics and philosophy, but still they had the boldness to persecute me. Now, he has this understanding of inner revelation, which does not even need Bible, in, in a sense. I will explain it. So he says that if you are wondering about reality and, and apply your dialectical reasoning to reality, you will arrive at a certain vision, a light. And uh, he himself says that I have arrived myself to this light because I didn't give slumber to my eyes. I was always uh, attentive to my thoughts. and. And suddenly this light came to me. It was kindled in my soul, like a 
Plato says in seventh letter that a philosophy is not like a knowledge of a uh, nomenclature of uh, some uh, information. But philosophy is when the light is kindled from your teacher to your soul, and then this light persists. The same is said by Patrizzi. He says that the light was kindled in my soul, and this light since then persists in me. So he, has, he had some inner revelation of light. And then he views everything through this light. So, and everything implies also Bible. He opens Bible and he sees the metaphors of Bible through his light. And he, sees, uh, uh, he speaks about this light in terms of inner logos or inner Hermes. He uses the Greek god Hermes. Metaphorically saying that each of us has this inner Hermes within us through which we can interpret. Interpret means that to find metaphysical meanings everywhere, in nature or in the text. And Bible for him is also a revealed text. He believes in revelation of Bible, but he explains Bible through his inner revelation, through his inner Hermes, and cracks the metaphors of Bible through this vision. And you see everywhere in his uh, philosophy that he sporadically uh, says, that, oh, Moses also says the same as Plato has said, but in a way of a uh, curtain of metaphors. And I am the one who can take this curtain, um, uh, take this curtain off and show you what really Moses mean, meant, or Esaias, or St. Paul, or King David. Actually, he translated the Psalms and made commentaries on Psalms, but only preface to it is uh, uh, excellent now, but the very translation of Psalms and uh, the commentaries are lost. So, uh, but uh, even in the preface you see that he all the time said, that, look, David is, uh, is saying the same as Plato. So they are in, uh, in one, under one, uh, I would say, light of truth, David and Plato. Of course, all this is uh, crowned by Christ. But again, Patrizzi says that my inner revelation also came through Christ. So he says that Christ is life giver, savior of my theories. So uh, what does it mean? If Christ is savior, life giver of his theories, then are his theories savior of Patrizzi's soul? Then you get very dangerous doctrine that uh, there is salvation through philosophy. Christ can save philosophers through the inner revelations which come from Christ. It's not explicitly said in, in Patrizzi, but we can be direct to this understanding. So uh, um, maybe some uh, time should be left also for Rustaveli, and then uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Because Patrizzi dreamt about establishing a tradition of philosophy in Georgia. He said that my dream was to leave my disciples here who would continue in the, in the same spirit. And probably he has done it, because if you read his uh, uh, translations and commentaries on Proclus, his uh, <coughs> grand synthesis of Christian belief, faith, and Neoplatonic lore, you see that he addresses to students. That he, can, he cannot read Patrizzi without uh, projecting before you that his audience as well, an audience of students. And uh, probably he succeeded in it. And Rustaveli must be one of the students, either immediate student of Patrizzi or, or the one who was educated with the same, within the same milieu. And all the philosophy of Rustaveli's poem is a grand epic poem about love. But uh, this love is a mystical love, it's a metaphoric love also. It's, it's of course a love of, uh, um, romantic love of uh, man and woman. But romantic love for Rustaveli has is a manifestation of divine love. It's a kind of theophania. So through romantic love, you are imitating divine love of philosophers towards divine perfections. So all Rustaveli's poem is based on the same logic as Plato's Symposium. So we are ascending from lower forms of love to higher forms of love. Rustaveli's uh, source is Pseudo Dionysius as well. He quotes Pseudo Dionysius and names him directly. And also his source that is Patrizzi, because all his platonic uh, knowledge must come from Patrizzi. And why do we know it? Because he uses terminology which was invented by Patrizzi, which was introduced in, in Georgian philosophic terminology by Patrizzi and by nobody else. So Rustaveli uses exactly the same terminology which Patrizzi applies to Plato's ideas, to uh, essence, 
to genus and all these terms are used by Rostovsky. If uh, the, the, here is a Georgian audience, I can name those terms like Kaushiri, Tomi Guarta, Zenata. These are all terms from coming from Petrinsky. And not only terminology, but the very attitude of Rostovsky is philosophy. It's a metaphor of philosophic search of reality because uh, one of the main heroines of the uh, of the poem is her name is Tina Tin, a princess. And Tina Tin means a reflection of a sun on a wall. So you can make it a metaphor. So philosopher is kind of a, who, who is not a sun himself or herself, it's, uh, but he is a searcher of the sun because he has some illumination of sun in, in his soul, like a like a reflection of a sunlight on a wall. That's why all poem is based on curiosity of Tina Tin. Because Tina Tin says that I cannot be happy even with my love, even with my kingship, unless I solve the mystery of life. And the Tina Tin initiates the search of mystery of life uh, in the poem. And uh, you see many things in Aristotle which are drenched with uh, Platonic philosophy. He quotes Plato, and he quotes Plato alongside with apostles. And uh, strange, uh, strangely enough, he has a personage in his poem whose name is Socrates. And Socrates is the chief vizier of the king. And uh, actually, um, my, my last paper is about Socrates in Rustaveli. And, uh, and Socrates in Rustaveli, in my opinion, has a real connection with uh, historical Socrates, or Socrates from Plato's dialects. I was hinted to this because there are very few instances of irony in Rustaveli's poem. About four instances of irony. And two among them belong to Socrates. This personage. And I decided that there must be some riddle there. There must be a real Socratic irony here. And I discovered that it should be a real Socratic philosophical irony in all in those two instances. And my, my last article is, is about this. And it's not for excellence, of course. So, and uh, this was, in a way, uh, deadlock. Because Rustavelli finished the his final voice of philosophy in medieval Georgia. Why? Because uh, after that, there was a Mongol invasion, and uh, already the Dark Ages followed. And in the 16th century, you see that the same school where Patrizzi was reading his lectures, where he was saying to his students, uh, dare and uh, beat your ambition, that you think of it over yourself. And uh, so he was saying, beat your philodemia, beat your ambition to philosophize. Before, Emmanuel Kant said, Sapere Aude, it was like Patrick said similar thing to his students, that dare to think. And uh, so then decline followed. And in the same room, the king of Georgia in the 16th century was drinking wine out of hunting. So that was a uh, sign of uh, degradation. And one more thing, the Rustavali's time, philosophy is never neutral from politics. Because philosophy questions everything, the entire reality. And politics is part of the reality. And already in the 13th century, you see that there's a novel attitude towards political visions. And in the 13th century, during King Tamar's time, in the apex of this uh, culture, there are these uh, political movements initiated in Georgia to limit royal power. They, so they are saying that uh, let us relegate to king only executive function, and let us invent a tent like parliament, which would like uh, strike new laws. And king will have only to sign this. So they already there, they have this attitude that we should question everything. We should not rely on divine authority of kings unless we scrutinize it. And the historiographer of Tamar at the time is saying that, look, these were demonic people who wanted to limit the, the, uh, the power of the king. But actually, it can, it can be a reason, a result of philosophical inquiries in Georgia. There are some scholars who think that Khurtu Aslan, who initiated these political changes, which could not be achieved, of course, because they were nipped to the bar. The Khurtu Aslan and Chota Rustaveli was one of the same person. I, can, I cannot tell whether it is true or not. There are some surmises. But it happens within the spirit of philosophizing. So uh, I, here I will end. Probably I spoke too much. And, um, now the uh, floor will be open for you, for questions. I would like several times that uh, translations uh, of uh, philosophers uh, started since uh, 11th century. Yes. 
And how you explain the phenomena that the knowledge of uh, Greek art or uh, Byzantine art is visible in uh, Georgian art before 11th century in miniatures, for instance, and its uh, translations are started since 11th century and not before. Okay. Translations of philosophy started in the 11th century, but translation of all other genres of Byzantine literature was there already. You cannot name uh, a <coughs> single uh, author's great theologian of uh, Byzantium who is not uh, translated in Georgia. Maybe with exception of uh, Simeon the New Theology. But all great theologians were translated in, in Georgia in several times. We have numerous translations. And they were, you, actually, they were even forced to translate them because Greeks uh, uh, frequently accused Georgians of heresy. And Georgians had to translate all the, uh, this uh, Orthodox literature to show that we are not heretics, but we, have, that we read the same text that you read. So, but it was a tradition of a pious obeying of uh, church fathers. There was not a, the, the originality in thinking, in theological thinking, was shunned. They were saying that uh, we are good uh, theologians because we are not adding anything from our side. We are simply giving you what Greek fathers are saying. It was a tra tradition of rendering correctly, precisely what Greek fathers are saying and following it and obeying it. Actually, even um, the, this is a great tradition of piety, even sincere piety. When new translations are made of the previous treatises, for instance, the new translators are always giving some reverence to previous translators saying that we are not translating it because of uh, this, previous translations are bad, but simply uh, some, they, they invite some other reasons, that uh, previous translators were not exact because they accommodated their uh, language to needs of their audiences, but now we can accommodate these needs to uh, kind of more developed audience, so we can render it even more precisely. So this, of course they are criticizing it, but criticizing in a very reverent way. Also with uh, gospel, new gospel translations. It, they also created in 11th century, especially in, in Athonite circles of Georgian monks, because in Athos, Mount Athos, Georgian monastery was frequently attacked by Greeks. They wanted to deprive Georgians of this monastery. And one of the good reasons would be to say that they accuse them of heresy. We, an emperor would have deprived them of heretics, the place in Athos. That's why Georgians had to say that we are not heretics and uh, give us the, the codices which you acknowledge, codices of gospel, and we shall translate a new according to your censorship. And they translated a new in the 11th century, uh, the gospel. So now we, in Georgian churches, uh, 11th century texts are read as canonical. But when philosophy came with Patrizzi, this reverence also disappears, because it, uh, above reverence for him, important is dialectical scrutiny. That's why he scrutinizes uh, without reverence the previous translations. Uh, uh, and uh, simply freely says that Athenites' is canonical translations, translations are wrong, because Greek is in this way and Georgian renders in, in that way. And this uh, creates an error. So uh, we should amend this error by uh, simply changing the canonical translation. So Petrici applies his philosophical attitude also to this um, to, to, to uh, the, this tradition of reverence. He puts uh, above authority, he puts reason. And it's, uh, it's strange because it happens in Georgia, the same things were happening in Europe, but in Georgia it <coughs> did not develop. Maybe Erugena is a similar in ancient Europe. Still, it is quite strange that it, before the 11th century they didn't uh, translate the philosophers. No, they didn't. Um, for them, true philosophy was following uh, commandments. And uh, they, they, in hagiographic text, you see that uh, they were true philosophers. Not in the sense that new, that new dialectics of Aristotle, but they lived philosophic life. It means that they lived life of commandments. So for salvation, philosophy was not necessary. And salvation was all important and necessary. That's why uh, they translate only those texts which are important for salvation. But Patrizzi introduced a new dimension, and you know, a dangerous dimension for, for, for church, because then uh, you have this uh, scandal of uh, cross, as it's called, this scandal. Scandal of cross can be seen as abolished. Uh, Patrizzi doesn't say it, Patrizzi says that all knowledge of uh, pagans and uh, Hebrew prophets 
subjected themselves to revelation of uh, to coming of Christ. But uh, his Christology is not very uh, clear because he did not devote separate uh, treatises to Christology. We have only his philosophic writing. But uh, his train of thought could be led to this direction, where he could claim a uh, notion of uh, philosophic uh, perfection. Like it's an old uh, quarrel of Pelagius and uh, Augustine, the Pelagius claiming that we have in our natural powers some goodness through which we can develop ourselves. And Augustine is uh, fiercely attacking him, saying that uh, unless you embrace, you are so fallen that you cannot do anything, any development through your own powers. So Patrizzi in this quarrel would have sided more to Pelagian direction, probably. But for him, actually, this uh, divine eros and grace are, in a way, translatable somehow. This eros towards eternal reality, which consumes all of your soul and drags you to this uh, infinite striving to God, is, in a way, uh, uh, eros, is, in a way, a grace. So he translates philosophic errors to Christian grace, and in these terms uh, um, he may be led to saying that philosophers also achieve the same vision as saints of Christianity achieve. But uh, it's again conjecture which can follow from his writings. And uh, which role does Holy Spirit play in theological theology or theological theology practices? Holy Spirit, again, his technique, his, um, his kind of uh, attitude is such, such that in philosophical tradition there is one tradition which is a true tradition. And this true tradition for Patrizzi is Neoplatonism. And he presents a Neoplatonist, he doesn't call it a Neoplatonist, it's Platonist. Plato is a true theologian. And all those Platonists are explicating simply hidden and dark places in Plato. That's why sometimes he pro calls Proclus, but says that Plato says so. For him, Plato says so because Proclus is explicating Plato's hidden meaning for him. And he says that the, those Neoplatonic philosophers expose the true essence of reality. So they speak about, rea about truth that is uh, uh, co-eternal with reality. Aletheia homutois usim sinifestosa. He takes this expression from Platonic theology of Proclus. Truths that exist together with the structure of reality. For him, Platonists express this truth. But Christianity also expresses truth. So he has to bridge now these two traditions. And how he does it? He names, by Platonic terms, Christian terms. And Holy Spirit also becomes one of the Neoplatonic notions. And he has this one of Neoplatonists, this ineffable one, which you cannot construct a concept of, because beyond all concepts, like in Dionysius, it's the same. Yes, he takes it from Proclus. Apophatical, apophatical reality of one, and from one come two powers of one, which is, you know, Proclus, limit and infinity. And so Patrizzi translates Christian Trinity within the term of Neoplatonism, saying that one is the Father, and the limit and infinity are the Son and the Holy Spirit. And they are consubstantial. He said. This is not in Platon, but Patrizzi adds this Christian tenet of consubstantiality to this vision of uh, one limit and infinity. Of course, he run, uh, runs all the time a risk of um, being misinterpreted and of putting, because in, in a Neoplatonic hierarchy, the one is, is uh, definitely about limit and infinity, because in Neoplatonism, there is no causality without hierarchy. But Christianity has causality without hierarchy, because Father causes the Son, but Son is not inferior to the Father. But when he translates this to Neoplatonic, in Neoplatonic terms, he, ha he has to explain it more and more, not to be misinterpreted. He wants to uh, say that no, Son is not below Father, but sometimes it's difficult for him to do so, because he definitely um, is uh, uh, trapped by the very terminology of Neoplatonism, and there runs the risk of being uh, interpreted in, ha in a heretical way, like subordin subordination, nationalism in Trinity. But here's Holy Spirit translated in as the first limitlessness or infinity. Protea Peiria. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, you mentioned that uh, all these uh, new translations uh, of philosophy started the Galati School. The Galati School was established by King David the Builder. Yes. Uh, um, don't you think that it had to do something with the program of King David? 
um, um, emulating or rivaling the, uh, the Byzantine court uh, and, and you know, uh, considering that having a, a, a school which, which had been established by, um, uh, by Constantine Monomachus um, as a kind of model uh, he has to do if he wants to... Quite, quite, quite possible. Quite, quite possible because there is a rivaling of Georgians and Byzantines. You see, uh, you see it's a common topos. And with King David, you see that he tries to emulate the saintly, he has a model of a saintly king. He always carries with him camels with uh, books. And uh, even during the battle, he's reading Gregory the Theologian, for instance, and he forgets about battle, as the uh, as, uh, as, uh, hagiographer says. And, uh, and also, he writes about philosophy, uh, King David. And King David was very broad minded. In, when he recaptured Vilisi from Arabs and re established it as a uh, capital, because uh, Tbilisi was in hands of Arabs for centuries, and David, after the famous battle of Didgori against Seljuks, he uh, re re reconquered Tbilisi and made it the capital. In Tbilisi, he opened uh, astro astrological, or astronomical at the time it was the same, astrological school where Arab Muslim uh, astrologers read lectures. So he was very broad minded. And himself, he writes that. He was uh, reading philosophical text, but he confesses that, oh, I, I made a sin that uh, I, uh, st I studied uh, Greek wisdom. So, I'm f but he repents in his prayer of repentance of being engaged in studying Greek wisdom. <coughs> but m maybe uh, this uh, context of repentance uh, is uh, too, ex too much an exaggeration. And he really was uh, sympathetic to philosophy. Uh, in the wake of uh, Patricia, were there any anti-Islamic or anti-heretic apologies? Or so? Yes, uh, of course. Yes, there, there were. Yes, um, yes, of course. There were anti-heretical anti uh, apologies, anti-Islamic. Yes. In there, 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 were there any terms uh, elaborated by Patricia and so? No, but Pat Patricia is not engaged in this chorus. Yes, yes, I know, but uh, from his entourage. So. Have, have they used have they used his his ideas his uh, dialectic to ah to Pat Patricis, I, I, I don't I don't think so no I don't think so Patricis, uh, was aware of elitist nature of his philosophy he was saying that I am developing a certain new language and new attitude and that is not for plebs that he said it's for for philosophers so he says he's aware of the el elitist uh, uh, nature. He, uh, I think he believed that uh, these uh, commentaries on Proclus are not for the entire audience of Christian, uh, entire Christian audience, I think. And uh, because uh, it's really problematic, uh, the, the ideas he put there are quite, quite problematic. Like Ishtan, uh, with Ishtan we have worked uh, a few years about this and Ishtan indicated me to some originist, very, uh, precise originist traits in his soul. Actually, Origen is also attacked in, in Georgian church at that time. You see the um, treat, uh, treat, uh, not treat, biblical commentaries, uh, um, like uh, the biblical text, and there are commentaries. And in commentaries, you see the criticisms of on Origen. And there are verses against Origen, that Origen is dragon of uh, hell. Uh, he's called like this in the scenography. But Patrizzi has these originistic ideas about uh, uh, intellect. He separates Logos, uh, Christ, from intellect of Christ, and he, and he puts intellect uh, as a Plato's world of ideas, and beyond it is the Logos, which uh, created this intellect, and it very much uh, um, uh, resonates with originist idea about the creation of uh, human intellect. But uh, that's why I think I don't think uh, Patrice intended his uh, tools to be used for specifically theological quarrels against heretics and uh, Islam. But he simply wanted to pow, pow away towards the dialectical approach to true reality, to true being. And for him it was possible, even for philosophers. And what can be known about the fate of this uh, heretical body of texts in uh, Georgian history, the Dark Ages, or their influence yes. later on? Uh, actually, the, I told you that this, his translation of Psalms I think was destroyed uh, because uh, 
why I think so, because um, the preface of it remains in its entirety, from the beginning to end. I have translated it into English. I have uh, sent it to you. So this uh, preface survives from the beginning to end. But when the sound should start with his commentaries, this part is missing. And I think that they left this preface as a very interesting philosophical thought, but they omitted those parts, which was dangerous for church, because sound was used in every church uh, service. And to, to make this metaphysical explanation of sounds uh, was regarded probably as dangerous for ordinary um, church uh, goers, let's say, to see that uh, these sounds can, could be interpreted in terms of Plato. <coughs> but they said that they could be interpreted, that, that Patrick said that they must be interpreted in those terms. So that these texts uh, are missing. But uh, the texts when Patrizzi commented on Proclus, we have in several manuscripts, because they were not as dangerous as commentaries on Psalms. The audience which could read the Proclus and its commentaries was very little. And probably it was not such a small audience was not a danger for church. That's why these uh, texts were rewritten <coughs> several times, and uh, they were revered by Georgians. They understood that they were important Piece, piece of philosophical reasoning, and even if not understood, they were revering it, like taking, putting it to a very high respect. But uh, if you see how they comment on Patrizzi, they don't understand him. I, I uh, want to ask you, have you ever thought about uh, this uh, strange situation that uh, Armenians and Georgians uh, they were always in touch for centuries. And uh, there was no wall, no religious, no, no religious wall. Religious was, uh, no. Yeah, was the the, 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 the families, yes, it's right. the, family, the royal families even were connected to the nobility. No, I, I, I mean, uh, it was not, not an ethnic wall, but it was a religious wall, because sometimes when Georgians would adopt uh, uh, non calcedonian theology, yes, they were called true. Armenians, and right. Armenians adopted Adopted but, were called Georgians. But uh, my, uh, question is, my question is related to the fact that if several hundred years before, uh, in the 5th, 6th century, they were uh, in Armenia translating uh, uh, Aristotle or the other uh, philosophers, how come next uh, nation which was connected uh, with us was uh, so late started this? What, what, what is your uh, explanation for that? I, 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 I have no explanation other than uh, what I have spoken already. I there must be some enigma. So so I, 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 some strange thing. I, I, I cannot, I, I cannot Similarity in art, similarity in architecture, similarity in uh, translations of uh, Greek uh, or uh, other uh, theologians and suddenly this strange Of course, they knew that those texts were there. Like you said, you have a lot of uh, schools of uh, Georgian translators all over the uh, Orient. Yes, uh, there are uh, 30 monasteries in uh, Palestine, there are monasteries in Black Mountain, monasteries in yes. Mount Olympus, you in see? Byzantium, in Constantinople. You see? There was uh, the school of uh, Georgian translators under uh, Queen uh, Mary uh, of Alania. She gathered the Georgian intellectuals and there was a monastery as far as in Bulgaria and uh, Cyprus, and they read many things. But why they did not translate philosophy before the 11th century? I don't know. Probably because of this pious tradition that we don't need it for salvation, and all this uh, the theological literature should be first rendered. But later, from from 11th century, the new attitude started. I don't have uh, I don't have uh, any other answer yet. Perhaps will be revealed one day, some, one, one, will, one day, one day will be revealed the text of uh, philosophy translated in Georgia in ninth century. Then I'll have some other opinion. But uh, as, as one yet, day will be discovered, maybe. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but uh, not yet. Um, uh, in Rustav Ali, um, uh, my first question is: this connection of Rustav Ali to Patrizzi, is it your discovery or? Uh, was it well no, it is not my discovery. Actually, it's, um, you know, Damana Melikishvili, uh, he was, I think, uh, uh, most, how would say, vocacious um, was, uh, to, to indicate those uh, similarities of Patrizia and Gustavelli in, in terminology. But it's not only terminology, but it's the entire uh, setting of poem within the uh, Platonic uh, doctrine of Eros. 
-hmm. It's kind of eros, in, and again, why Rustavelli could also have been persecuted by church. You have the no notion that church was not very easy going with Rustavelli. Because Rustavelli says that, uh, that when you fall in love, this falling in love can come from divine source, this romantic love. And if you are practicing this romantic love, this, this kind of energy, divine energy, practicing it, you are imitating by this philosophical love of, toward divine perfection. And he says that, uh, um, so give me the love of, uh, so give me the love of uh, lovers. Uh, and uh, immediately below he says, and give me the remission of my sins. So are these two things logically connected? If they are, then it's a kind of a dangerous doctrine that through love and practicing this love, you can reduce your sins. But this love is not uh, the, how to say, uh, confines only of Christian tradition. This love is uh, everywhere. Then. So this theophany of love can happen in different cultures. That means that the elevation of soul through love can happen in different cultures. Like in Patrizzi, it's a similar thing. Yes? But, but so my second question is, however, his model for this, the, the, the fools for love, that's a Muslim model. That's, that's, a, a, that's, that's a Sufi. Sufi. Ah, absolutely. Uh, but but, but please, please, please just yeah. uh, let me formulate the question. And we have uh, parallels in basically contemporary, I have just learned, in basically contemporary Armenian literature. Uh, uh, Erzen Katsi, I, I just I have I just know. learned about it. So was this relationship uh, ever explored? That you 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 have in in the same time parallel phenomena in Armenian and uh, Georgian literature. You have the same elements: <coughs> Platonism, Christianity, and uh, the influence of Sufism. Yes, yeah, so, um, unfortunately, I cannot answer. Uh, fully your question, because I don't know this Armenian author. But uh, Sufi influences are there in Rustavelli, and they were discussed, of course. For instance, he has uh, this uh, uh, image of a ruby, which on the uh, rays of the sun becomes yellow and sunny. So this is a Sufi image, when ruby uh, loses its features and gets divine features. So he takes, uh, takes this from Sufi, and he has also other uh, elements, like he has this Al-Halaj death, uh, Rustavelli. Al-Halajia was a Sufi mystic who said that uh, I'm an absolute, I'm Allah. So uh, he was, uh, for that reason, he was uh, killed by Muslim authorities. And Rustavelli uses this uh, passage from uh, Al-Halaj's death when his friend, Al-Halaj's friend, threw a uh, flower to Al-Halaj. Uh, and other people were throwing stones, but he threw flower uh, because uh, uh, if he stood like this without doing anything, he would have been suspected as supporter of Al Halaj and could be punished. So he took a flower and threw it out of fear. And Rustavelli uses this image of uh, throwing flowers uh, in his poem. So he uses some Sufi elements. But uh, I have spoken with one Azerbaijani and a student of Rustavelli uh, who knew very well Sufism. And he told me that. Rustavelli has elements of Sufis, but it's very much unsufistic un un uh, poem. Because in Sufi poems, uh, the lovers do not end with actual marriage and actual uh, relationship. But in Rustavelli, there is actual marriage and carnal relationship. It's a it's carnal marriage which imitates the uh, absolute. So it's a uh, different uh, logic. Why do you think that Proclus played this very important mediating role? I think because Proclus has written a treatise which is an unparalleled treatise. Because it's a treatise, elemental theology, very succinct and full exposition of entire metaphysical universe. The Proclus has more elaborate treatises like Platonic theology, but uh, here he makes uh, everything very, I'll say, terse and clear and succinct, as succinct as possible, and very logical. And this uh, logical train of thought of problems is, in a way, devoid of any uh, kind, kind of any, as much as possible, of any specifically religious agenda. So he doesn't name the gods, names of gods, but he simply presents metaphysical schemes within this logical sequence of thought. 
And Perez, uh, for Patrizzi, this treatise was very much important for teaching his student what is philosophy. That's why he chose this student, uh, this treatise, and he exposed the entire philosophy through this treatise. So he speaks about presocratics while discussing Proclus. He speaks about Empedocles, Parmenides, he speaks about Neoplatonist, Aristotle, some quarrels between uh, Aristotelians and Platonists, but he does it all uh, while exposing the treatise of Proclus. But he has chosen it as a best exposition of metaphysical universe. I think that's why Proclus was important for him. And also Proclus was important for him as true expositor of Plato. And mostly he sides with Proclus when there is inner quarrel among Neoplatonists. He shows as the Neoplatonic voice, the voice of Proclus. But it cannot be the voice of Damascus or voice of Plotinus. In rare instances, he sides with Plotinus. But he says that that's Neoplatonism. He presents Neoplatonism as one, a quarrel-less system. Eclectic, ec eclectic vision of Neoplatonism. Um, now, when Patrizzi is, was, was a student of um, John Italus, as you say, mm -hmm. and Italus was maybe, as you say, overzealous in defending his own consciousness and his results, did uh, Patrizzi learn his lesson? Mm -hmm. Did he go home and just um, did not really promulgate these ideas of his teacher? Did you find anything heretical in his writing? Of course, um, of course, I find uh, things heretical in his writing. He has a similar spirit. Uh, he follows his own train of thought. There, there were like quarrels in Georgian scholarship saying that sometimes Patrizzi simply exposes Platonic philosophy, and in not, these are not his ideas, but these are simply he exposes problems. But uh, his theological writing should be different. But it's kind of an uh, argument of, uh, against Galileo Galilei when they, they told him that there are still, uh, so there is this uh, circle, this uh, crystal, um, like a roundness uh, on moon. And he says, but there are these crystal mountains also. So this is kind of such argument. I think there is only one discourse in Patrician. This discourse is synthetic discourse of philosophy and theology. And sometimes this discourse is at odds with official teaching of church. But I think Patrizzi um, takes his stance on Christian, Christian theology as well. Because when he translates Nemesius of Emesa, and Nemesius of Emesa was bishop in fourth century, it was before fifth ecumenical council, when Origenism was, was condemned. And Nemesius of Emesa has the doctrine of pre-existence of souls. And Patrizzi simply translates him and uh, does not quarrel with him. So for him, Nemesius is true expositor of Christianity. And uh, um, perhaps he has his own attitude to Christian tradition also. He takes something, he denies other things. So he's very free even in relating himself with uh, the dogmatic tradition of Christianity. And of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be problematic. Because you cannot, uh, uh, yes, there is a general truth. And uh, it uh, crisscrosses and permeates different traditions. But uh, there, in Christianity, there were some specific truths as well. Like Thomas Aquinas uh, said that I can, by my, through my lumen naturalis, through my, through my natural ability of reasoning, arrive to great truths, among them to truths of existence of God, immaterial God, and that this God is one. This I can do through my lumen naturalis, like Patrice would say, through my logos inner light of intellect. But, as uh, Aquinas would say, this is not enough and I, sh I need a revelation to know that God is Trinity. Because my natural light, Lumen Naturalis, cannot say that God is Trinity. I need some specific revelation from personal God that I may know it. But Patrizzi even erases this difference. He says that philosophers through their, let's say, Lumen Naturalis, had a Trinitarian vision of God. So this is a too bold an attitude towards the truth. And maybe that's why Patrizzi was considered as dangerous, and maybe he is dangerous in this sense. But uh, he finds that the human dignity depends on your own actualization of inner logos and inner light of intellect. Okay, if there are no more questions, then um, I thank very much our speaker again, uh, Leon, for introducing us to uh, the arrival of philosophy in Georgia. Thank you very much.